Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Vic Ford. I'm the Associate Vice President for Agriculture and Natural Resources for the Arkansas University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture. And I want to welcome you to Farm to Freezer, Direct Marketing of Beef. Without further ado, I want to uh, introduce Dr. Mike Looper, who is the department head for the University of Arkansas Fayetteville Animal Science Department. And he's with the Bumpers College. And he will uh, introduce uh, the first speakers and uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Uh, yes, my name is Mike Looper and I am the head of the Department of Animal Science for the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture. And so we have faculty here in Fayetteville, but we also have faculty in Little Rock and you're gonna hear from both faculty from Fayetteville and Little Rock tonight. And we also have faculty uh, in Hope in the Southwest corner of the state. So I wanna welcome you and say thank you for participating in this webinar. We've had an um, outstanding response to the invite tonight. And so we'll look forward to the interaction. Uh, I do want to recognize and ex publicly appreciate our partners, uh, the Arkansas Farm Bureau, the Arkansas Beef Council, and also the Arkansas Cattlemen's Association. So we thank all of our collaborative partners tonight. Uh, we look forward to our speakers. Uh, with that, Travis Justice from Arkansas Farm Bureau and the Beef Council. Travis? Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to join you at the, uh, with this program here tonight. And uh, uh, on behalf of the Farm Bureau, we appreciate the ability to cooperate and uh, participate uh, in, this, uh, in this program. You know, the interest in locally produced, locally sourced beef products has uh, certainly been growing uh, recently and more particularly uh, during this COVID crisis, the interest has tended to uh, to spike and so uh, the uh, the interest in locally sourced uh, protein products has uh, has been uh, uh, heightened greatly here in recent months uh, from a farm bureau standpoint uh, you know we recognized this interest some time ago and then and given the current situation and difficulties that uh, the processing sector has had and the interest in this topic uh, you know, we're working with a number of others and pursuing some some actions currently to uh, try to expand the uh, processing capacity of this state for, for locally sourced products. From the um, uh, representative of the Beef Council as well, from a, the Beef Council standpoint, our interest in promoting beef sales are, are not only globally, but here at home as well. And uh, I would point out that just uh, a year ago, the uh, the council uh, funded a, a study conducted by the public policy group with extension, but uh, to kind of profile the beef processing sector in Arkansas and identify the challenges and opportunities that it faces. And so uh, we've uh, engaged in this issue along with uh, the university and all their cohorts as well. So I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to uh, help uh, participate in this conference and uh, and now for an additional word of welcome I'll turn it over to uh, to Cody Burkham with the Arkansas Cattle. Thank you Travis. It's good to be here with y'all this evening and uh, my name is Cody Burkham and I serve as the Executive Vice President of the Arkansas Cattlemen's Association. Uh, just like Travis I want to echo uh, my appreciation to the University of Arkansas, the Beef Council and Farm Bureau for helping us put this uh, webinar together. As Travis just mentioned, there is a large uh, uh, amount of interest out there in locally producing our beef and uh, taking care of the Arkansas consumer. And uh, at the Arkansas Academies, we support that 100% and uh, are working diligently every day uh, to make sure that those capabilities are out there for our cattle producers. So uh, if we can help you in any way uh, after this webinar, please feel free to give us a call at any time, 501-224. Uh, 2114 is our office number, or you can look us up online at arbeef.org. We also have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So we're easy to get a hold of, and we're here for the cattle producers in Arkansas. We want to uh, help you in any way we can. So with that, uh, tonight I'll turn it over to our first speaker, Dr. Shane Gadbury with the University of Arkansas. Thank you for that introduction, Cody. Uh, it's my privilege to visit with you this evening to discuss feeding farm-raised uh, cattle for slaughter. Um, I'm gonna jump right into this presentation. Um, in this presentation, uh, we're going to briefly introduce 
three thoughts. Uh, the first thought is going to be animal options that are commonly discussed for slaughter, production goals, and then feeding plans based on those production goals. So three common cattle types available on farm for slaughter includes those calves, heiferets, and cool cows. Now feeding calves is advantageous because of breeding for carcass traits. Um, and also we have less maturity in those animals, so we see improvements uh, in uh, tenderness and other carcass characteristics. Um, however, developing a calf for slaughter can take uh, quite a lengthy period of time from start to finish. Um, so we may look toward that hefferette where we've already invested a little bit of time in development to get that heifer from uh, weaning to the uh, point of breeding. And we have some of those females that for whatever reason don't breed and so they could fit uh, well to roll over uh, into a uh, slaughter calf program. Uh, these are often going to be yearling aged heifers so they're a lot like a feeder calf that's coming out of a stalker program. And so investing a little bit of time and feed into those females uh, can be an additional uh, return on investments taking them on out to slaughter. Uh, one of the challenges that I commonly hear about working with that hefferette um, is that we're going to have to uh, manage a heifer that's potentially cycling. So if we've got a uh, fence line contact with uh, some uh, mature males um, or uh, just the fact of heifers riding one another, if we've got several in a pen and concern over bruising, can make the feeding out a hefferette a little bit of a challenge. Uh, there's some things we can do in our program uh, by feeding a medicated feed additive like MGA to control that cycling. But you also have to look at your market and, and whether or not you want to uh, introduce some supplemental hormones into your feeding program uh, and whether or not that local market um, is something that you're uh, willing to uh, invest in that additional management uh, or if that local market is really wanting to target something uh, that has uh, no additional uh, growth promotion management uh, like medicated feed additives or uh, the use of uh, growth promoting implants. Uh, but that heiferette is definitely uh, an animal to uh, consider in the slaughter program. Um, and then finally, that third uh, individual that we may discuss for slaughtering could be that cool cow. Um, definitely, we could see some potential to add value in those uh, mature cows when you look uh, a lot of times at that uh, cool cow price uh, that at the cell barn. Um, but there are also some issues that we're going to face uh, with slaughtering that cool cow. Uh, those include uh, cutability which will be discussed later on. Uh, issues with yellow fat and its effects on um, the, the taste of the product and cooking odors. Uh, and then with the maturity, the tenderness. Uh, but these are uh, some things that can be uh, managed as, around as well. And we'll discuss those in this presentation. So our product goals. Uh, two typical programs that we're managing are a foraged finished program, uh, a grain finished program, and sometimes it may be a hybrid of those two programs. Uh, for this presentation, we're really gonna focus on the two individually, forage finished and grain finished, and not really uh, go into any detail on the hybrid program that's a combination of both. So let's start off with the forged finished program. The characteristics of a forged finished calf at slaughter is going to include that these calves will typically have less fat cover and they will generally weigh less than a grain finished calf. And the reasons why we uh, see that reduction in weight and reduction in fat cover often deals with the length of time it takes to get uh, that growing calf from weaning weight up to a final slaughter weight and the effects of forage on the weight gain and the length it takes to get there. Uh, so what I wanna demonstrate here is this table illustrates uh, the challenge with forage finishing. So calves provided a poor quality forage diet and only gaining a half a pound per day based on that first row will take over two and a half years to reach a thousand pounds which is a really common uh, target finish weight in a foraged finish program. Uh, we also have to remember a lot of times in a foraged finish program, 
uh, that consumer that is looking for that product is often looking for a leaner product uh, and they're also uh, looking for a product that's associated with uh, forage grasses in the diet and the impact that has on uh, the fatty acid profile of the meat. Um, so a thousand pounds is a very common target to talk about. And so when we think about duration, two and a half years is an awfully long period of time if we don't have a forage base that is capable of putting much weight gain on that calf each day. Uh, so whereas on the flip side, if we have a forage program that's producing some moderately good rates of gain uh, in the magnitude of one and a half to two pounds per day, we've shortened that duration to get that calf from 500 pounds weaning weight to that thousand pounds of uh, marketing slaughter weight in about eight to 11 months. So this table illustrates the rate of gain a calf may achieve at different times of the year for different forages. Now calves will gain weight poorly on toxic endophyte infected tall fescue uh, while very good weight gain can be achieved with non-toxic endophyte infected fescue. So you can see in this table uh, our different seasons of the year and when forages would be available. In that first column we see the toxic tall fescue that at its peak quality in times of the year where the toxins would uh, have less uh, stressful influences on that animal, we may see upwards to uh, three quarters of a pound per day. Uh, but when we get into that summer slump period, we can depress that weight gain uh, to as low as uh, a quarter of a pound per day uh, and even potentially less. Uh, now, switching forages over from uh, a non-toxic endophyte infected fescue uh, to a, from a toxic fescue to a non-toxic fescue, we can see the difference in weight gain. Uh, with a non-toxic endophyte infected fescue, these are called the friendly endophytes or the friendly fescues, we can see weight gains upwards of two pounds per day. Um, we can see those weight gains in the springtime. We can see those weight gains in the fall time. Uh, the reason why I'm not indicating two pounds per day of gain or, or anything less than that in the summertime is that these novel endophyte fescues, while they produce really good weight gains, can be sensitive to overgrazing, especially during that summer time period. And so if we could get those cattle off of that uh, friendly fescue and onto a different forage, uh, then we're helping to maintain a really good stand of forage that can add some really good weight gain on calves. Um, now within those systems, we can definitely introduce some clovers into our fescue stands. Um, both the uh, toxic fescue and the non-toxic fescue, uh, clover makes a really good interseeded addition to those stands. And we can bump weight gains by about a quarter pound per day by adding that clover to those fields. And even more depending upon what percent stand clover we have out there. We can look uh, further uh, into our interseeded programs uh, where we're relying on annuals like ryegrass, small grains, and possibly spring oats. Uh, with ryegrass, we can generally rely on having that forage available in springtime and observe about two pounds per day of gain. Uh, with the small grains, uh, we can usually expect to see some late fall uh, grazing, depending upon how that forage was established. Definitely some early spring grazing that would produce two pounds per day of gain. Once we get into the late spring period, uh, let's say mid-April uh, on uh, into the uh, late spring and early summer months, that weight gain for those small grains is gonna to start to diminish as that forage uh, goes from that vegetative high quality stage to that reproductive stage where it's trying to go to seed and quality is diminishing. Uh, one of the things that our forage specialists have looked at and have seen some really good responses on fall production with are spring oats. So with spring oats, we can see around two pounds per day of gain uh, with that high quality forage. The challenge we see with the spring oats is that uh, once we get into a winter time, uh, we often are gonna experience winter kill with those spring oats. So it's gonna be a short-lived, high quality, uh, fall grazed crop. Now during the summertime, 
Uh, obviously, those cool season grasses aren't as productive or not in uh, existence at all. And so we're going to have to rely on our warm season grasses, most commonly in Arkansas, Bermuda grass. Now, in early spring, we can see two pounds per day of gain on Bermuda grass. As we proceed into summer, that weight gain uh, typically will drop to around a pound a day. And then in early fall, as the temperatures uh, cool off, um, we could see weight gains kind of pick back up uh, in response to some temperature if we're managed in that forage stand uh, for quality. Um, to complement that Bermuda grass, uh, we could uh, look at an alternative with crabgrass. Now crabgrass is going to be uh, more of an, an annual type grass that does a really good job of receiving itself. Uh, the quality of crabgrass, those uh, newer planted varieties of crabgrasses are really good quality, they're really palatable, and have the potential to produce um, upwards to two pounds per day of gain. So when you look at this uh, particular table, you'll notice that there's gaps with all of these forages where times of the years there's good gains um, with abundance of forage and quality of forage, and then other times of the years, each of them has its limitation. And so the moral to this story is that uh, to really achieve that one and a half to two pounds per day of gain, uh, you're really going to need to put together a forage plan focusing on a year-round uh, forage supply because no one single commonly grazed forage crop in Arkansas is going to do a good job of achieving that high rate of gain year-round. Now forage abundance is going to be equally as important to forage quality. Pastures that are overstocked may have high quality but not enough mass for good calf weight gain. Then pastures that are understocked may need to be clipped from time to time due to spot grazing, creating what we'll call a bimodal distribution of forage quality and quantity. So we have these patches of overly mature grasses that the calves won't graze. And then we have these patches of overgrazed areas that are really high in quality. It's just the calves keep going back to those same places to graze over and over again. And so there's just not much quantity in those overgrazed patches. Um, so the year long calves may need to uh, be stocked at somewhere between a half to one acre per calf. And uh, the important uh, thing to remember is that uh, when, you, when you step into a forage based uh, finishing program, you're probably better off to start out with an understocked forage program than going in to one that's overstocked. If you're overstocked, you may have to make up ground and, and switch to what I discussed earlier being that hybrid program where it takes a combination of both forage and grains uh, to get that calf finished out in a timely manner. So that was a little coverage of the concepts around forage finishing. Now I want to transition over into a discussion of grain finishing. Uh, so when we think of that uh, grain finished calf, similar to the one in this uh, slide image here, uh, these calves uh, are considered finished when they reach approximately 28% body fat for small marbling. So visually, this is going to equate to about a body condition score seven and a half on a nine point scale. Uh, many of us are used to thinking about that body condition score with mature calves or mature cows. Uh, so that body condition score idea can be applied to these finished calves as well. So we're looking to that uh, calf that's uh, carrying some noticeable fat cover um, in the brisket, over the ribs, um, and a little bit excess beyond fat pones just around that uh, tail head. So calves coming out of a commercial feed yard today uh, would typically weigh 1,350 to 1,450 pounds. Now farm finished calves, not like the commercial feed yard calf, but the farm finished calf, we would typically expect to weigh less at finishing time. Um, a calf that's finished on grain at home is going to likely weigh closer to 1,200 to 1,300 pounds instead of that 1,350 to 1,450 pounds at that 7.5 body condition score. And the reason being is that calves that are finished on the farm are going to be less likely managed 
under growth promoting technologies that we can use real efficiently in that commercial feed yard. And so those growth promoting technologies can add that extra 50 to 150 pounds of body weight on that calf that we're not gonna see on farm without the use of this, without the use of those technologies. So as we looked at the relationship between weight gain and the time it takes a weaned calf at approximately 500 pounds to achieve a slaughter weight, and in this example, we're gonna use 1,250 pounds. What does that duration look like? Uh, so calves that are finished on grain are capable of achieving greater rates of weight gain and more uniform weight gain over time compared to uh, those uh, calves finished on forages. And this table does illustrate that calves fed a diet capable of supporting one and a half pounds per day of gain uh, will require nearly one and a half years to reach a finished weight after weaning. A diet capable of supporting three pounds per day gain will require 250 days feeding from weaning to a finished weight of about 1,250 pounds. So you can see that relationship, the greater the weight gain, the fewer days on feed. And so now let's look at an 800 pound calf with no growth implant technologies or medicated feed additives. What type of diet would it require to achieve a one and a half pound per day of gain up to a three pound per day of gain? Uh, so if we look at a modest rate of gain, one and a half pounds per day, that diet would need to contain about 10% crude protein and 64% TDN. That's a very easily achieved rate of gain with growing calves uh, with uh, forage and some supplementation. Now for a more aggressive weight gain that's gonna mimic closer to feedlot finishing, we're talking about three pound per day plus weight gain. And to achieve that with an 800 pound calf, we're gonna need a diet that's closer to 15% protein and 84% TDN. Now I do want to point out that there is a relationship between the amount of protein needed in the diet and the age of the calf. So a very young calf will need a higher percentage of protein in its diet compared to that 1100 pound calf that is very near finishing. So from that perspective, you also need to consider how long do I wanna develop out my calves? And maybe I need a growing diet and a finishing diet, um, or I need a finishing diet that's gonna have a higher percentage of protein very early in the finishing phase, and then a lower percentage of protein that can be achieved by the addition of corn later in the finishing uh, phase. To complement that, um, here's a few practical tips uh, when managing for high grain-based finishing diets. So we wanna start off slowly with that grain-based finishing program. 1% of body weight is a reasonable starting rate. And then we wanna build up to that final feeding rate over about a three week period. Now most feed blends do not have enough roughage built into them. So that typical three way or five way that you might get from the feed store doesn't have built in roughage. If you don't see cottonseed holes in that mixed feed, you probably don't have roughage built in. And so we need to provide some coarse, coarse roughage to these cattle fed a high grain diet in the magnitude of about a quarter to a half a percent of body weight. Now that quarter to a half a percent of body weight can be either in the form of free choice hay, it could be in the form of uh, cottonseed hulls added in the bunk, or it could be just access to pasture. But we need that coarse roughage to keep the rumen healthy and to keep that rumen buffered in a high concentrate diet. Now, many of us would be limit feeding grain, and if we're limit feeding grain to allow cattle to achieve that quarter to a half a percent of body weight coarse roughage in their diet, we wanna limit feed that grain to about two to two and a half percent of that animal's body weight as fed. And then it's really good if we could take that feeding rate and split it in half, where we feed half of it in the morning and half of it in the afternoon. Uh, so when uh, roughage is uh, not built into the diet, 
By doing this, we can help promote the consumption of those free choice roughages and help minimize the chance of any metabolic upset. Now, when cattle are gaining two and a half pounds per day, uh, you should be able to increase their feed amount by about one and a half to two pounds each month as they grow. Uh, it's important to uh, monitor the feed box, where if cattle are leaving feed in the trough, it's usually a sign of too much grain intake. If this occurs, back off the feed a little bit, watch them to see if they start cleaning the troughs up. As they start cleaning those troughs up, then you can gradually increase the amount of feed back into that trough gradually and to try to find that happy point between not leaving any feed the next day and knowing that you're getting enough grain intake in those cattle where they're eating about that two to two and a half percent of a body weight of grain. Now most of our commodity blends, now this is this point here I really want you to take home. Most of our commodity blends will not have added calcium. And that's a typical problem that we see with uh, trying to use these for farm finishing. Uh, what we can do is have that uh, blending facility add 30 pounds of feed grade limestone per ton of mixed feed to help get the calcium phosphorus ratio in an appropriate balance. Alternatively, we can add uh, about a, an, an ounce uh, per day of, of limestone in the trough uh, to help get that limestone in the cattle, but it's most convenient if we can get them to do it at the blending facility at a rate of about 30 pounds uh, per ton of feed. We also want to make sure we're providing uh, free choice access to clean water and a good uh, mineral vitamin supplement. I would encourage you to consider a couple of feed additive options that are coccidia stats. Uh, these cattle on high grain diets may be fed in a dry lot confinement situation that can get muddy from time to time. And so these coccidia stats like Bovitec, Rumensin, and Decox uh, can help prevent coccidiosis uh, in that confined environment. And the other thing I want you to consider is that uh, with these finishing diets, if you're really wanting to try to mimic that grain-fed beef flavor, um, I would say plan for uh, at least 50% corn in that finishing diet. Uh, when, you, when you look at surveys of commercial feedlots across the U.S., uh, the typical rate is at least 60% corn or more, or, or grains or more in these finishing diets. And so we just don't have enough of uh, beef sensory data from low starch byproduct type diets to really gauge what that steak is going to taste like if it was finished on something uh, like soybean hulls. Uh, so I really encourage you to consider using a considerable amount of corn if you're wanting that grain fed flavor in that finished beef product. Um, you may need to grow a to grow a calf out uh, at two different rates of gain. So you may need a growing diet and a finishing diet. So that growing diet as stated earlier would be a higher protein, uh, less grain-based diet uh, that would possibly be lower in energy. So it's gonna be composed of more byproduct feeds um, like corn gluten feed and soybean hulls. And then that finishing diet, uh, we can simply add corn on top of that growing diet to uh, both reduce protein and increase starch and energy to transition from a growing diet program to a finishing diet program. Uh, the reason why I state that you may consider having that growing diet in a finishing diet is that uh, one is those USDA inspected kill dates are gonna be scheduled well in advance. And when you're growing out cattle, think of this, it's easier to slow cattle down, putting them on a maintenance diet later in the growing program than trying to play catch up at the very end. Uh, that's sort of where our industry is today. Uh, so today we're kind of, we've got those cattle ready to go to the packing plants, but the feed yards are holding them back on a maintenance diet um, as the, uh, the supply chain uh, kind of gets worked through uh, the, the packing plant challenges with the COVID-19 um, and uh, the effects it's having on the kill floor. So putting cattle that are finished or near finished on a more maintenance type program um, will get you to that kill date in the desired condition better than if you're weighing a thousand pounds and the kill date is 
60 days out and that calf needs to be weighing 1250 pounds uh, in that 60 days. Um, so just something to consider there. And you may need to uh, grow cattle at different rates of gain to distribute your beef supply and to manage your uh, freezer space. The final uh, individual that we want to talk about is this cool cow. Uh, so there is an opportunity to add value to these cool cows by taking them to slaughter um, if uh, they did not breed back. So the important thing is, is that that cool cow, um, when we take her to slaughter, it's highly probable that her uh, fat, uh, her fat will be yellow colored from the keratin in the forages. Uh, so that yellow, that yellowing, that keratin uh, can impact uh, both uh, the flavor and have some cooking uh, odor characteristics along with it. Uh, research has shown that feeding cool cows a high grain diet, like we would that calf that we're finishing uh, for slaughter, that high grain diet for 60 days will shift that fat from the yellow color to the white uh, uh, fat uh, that won't have or will have a reduced chance of having that uh, grassy characteristic to it um, when it uh, is uh, consumed by, or, um, or cooked. Now with that said, we know that 60 days is sufficient to transition color from uh, the fat from yellow to white, uh, but it could take as much as 100 days uh, to uh, fully uh, get over that uh, grassy flavor associated with that forage fed beef. Uh, cool cows will generally have a lower feed conversion, so I definitely think that's something that you want to consider, um, especially if that cool cow is already con carrying a considerable amount of body fat. Uh, do you want to spend a lot of money uh, on grain uh, to uh, make that cow uh, even fatter, just trying to uh, shift her from a yellow fat to a white fat? Um, and then uh, with that cow, make sure that you're not taking a uh, pregnant cow to slaughter. Uh, so have your veterinarian pull blood, uh, just confirm that, that you're not feeding out a, a pregnant cow that's going to end up in slaughter. So I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, that was just a quick uh, run through of uh, just uh, feeding cattle on the farm for being a local provider of farm finished uh, beef. Um, if you have more information, contact your county extension agent. Um, at this point, I would like to turn the program over to our next speaker, Dr. Janelle Yancey uh, with the University of Arkansas. Uh, you may very well know her for her blog, uh, Moms at the Meat Counter. Well, thank you, Shane. Um, I really enjoyed that. And uh, now we're gonna talk about um, what to expect when you uh, send beef to the uh, a harvest facility and how much product you should expect. There's my contact information and my, um, my social media platforms if you're interested in those, but we're gonna launch in. Um, before you take your beef to the packing plant, the first thing you have to decide is what type of harvest facility am I gonna take it to? Um, and there's, there's two options in Arkansas and in some states you have three options. So um, for uh, Arkansas, you can take it to a USDA inspected plant um, and where you can take that beef there and then um, that beef will be inspected by a USDA employee um, as it's harvested and post harvest and that product can be sold um, across state lines, it can be sold to restaurants, it can be sold at farmers markets, stores, I mean, you can market that product yourself. Um, in some states, uh, there is the option of a state inspected plant where um, the states have an inspection system. Um, and those, in those states, um, you would be able to have uh, sell that beef within the state, but you couldn't sell it across state lines. Um, Arkansas does not have a state inspection, so you know we don't we don't have this option. But I think there's 20 some odd states that have that state inspection option. And then there's the option of custom exempt, and this is the situation where cattle are sold live, um, and then the harvest process is just a service that you pay the processor to do, and that is not done under inspection. Um, so those that beef has to be sold. You can sell it as a whole carcass or a whole beef. Um, you can sell it a half or a quarter, um, and that beef will actually be labeled um, when you get it as not for sale. 
Um, that doesn't mean it's unwholesome. It just means that you can't sell that by the piece um, as a as you could if it was state and uh, state or uh, USDA inspected. So what to expect as far as um, beef from your um, calf. So I looked up the average steer um, that's being harvested right now and these cattle are really, really heavy. Um, the average steer that's going to market right now in a commercial from a commercial feedlot to a commercial processing plant, those cattle weigh about 1,471 pounds. Um, and then when they go through the processing facility, about 62% of that is gonna become the carcass. Um, and that 62% is gonna vary somewhat. It's gonna vary a little bit based on muscling and fat. The more muscular it is, the fatter it is, um, the, the higher the dressing percentage is gonna be. So the more it's gonna be on the carcass. Fill can affect dressing percentage. Um, when you have uh, weather like we're having right now where it's hot and humid and the cattle are drinking a lot, um, that, that water weight that's in their gut is not gonna be part of the carcass. And so more fill is gonna be less carcass. Um, breed, the breed of the calf can affect uh, dressing percentage. So like a dairy calf or a longhorn, some of those type of lighter muscled um, cattle are gonna have lower dressing percentages. Um, pregnancy, you know, Shane just mentioned, you wanna check and see if those cattle are pregnant. Sometimes pregnant, pregnant heifers, pregnant cows make it into the processing plant and that pregnancy is gonna really decrease your carcass weight and your dressing percentage depending on how far along she is. I just talked about weather and fill um, and how that can affect it um, weather in and of itself. And then something that has an effect on your dressing percentage is gonna be the skill of the processors. Um, and, and when you go to a plant, um, they, they keep a running tally um, for those employees of their dressing percentage every day um, so that they know that they're getting the most carcass out of your beef animals as they can. Um, and, but the skill is gonna have a little bit of an effect there too. So you take that 912 pounds of carcass and you cut that down into cuts. Um, and from that 912 pounds of carcass, you're gonna remove a lot of fat, you're gonna remove a lot of bone, you're gonna remove some tissue, um, lymph tissue, some connective tissue, some other tissues that are not gonna be part of our retail cuts. Um, and that's gonna turn into your uh, pounds of retail product that you're gonna get. Um, and you're gonna get about 61, 62%. Um, lots of things can affect that percentage of, of, of the retail cuts that come from the carcass. Again, muscling. Um, we cut up some, car, some cattle for our uh, young cattlemen's leadership class. And one of those heifers that we cut up was, was a little bit light muscled. And we saw that in the cut value of those uh, when, we, when we looked at the value of that carcass. So lighter muscle cattle are gonna have less uh, retail weight. Uh, fat, the fatter they are, that fat is going to be trimmed away. So that's going to, the fatter they are, the less retail weight you're going to have. Again, the skill of your processors um, is going to have a fat, an effect. Some of the cuts that you choose, um, you know, what you choose to grind versus what you choose to cut into steaks and roast, and then whether, whether or not your processor wants to make bone-in or boneless cuts or what you choose as far as boneless or bone-in cuts, those are gonna affect your, your percentage there too. So we had a 1,400 pound steer that goes to a process, processor. We had 912 pounds of carcass. These are, these are big cattle. Um, and that's gonna give us about 558 pounds of retail cuts. Now, Shane just said that that's, that's a really heavy calf. There's, these um, home finished cattle are not gonna be that heavy. So I did the same math um, with that 1,200 pound steer, um, I was thinking along the lines of a show steer, um, but the 1,200 pound steer is really more of a home finished weight that we would get. So if you take that 1,200 pound steer and you get a 62% carcass, that's gonna be about a 750 pound carcass, and then about 61% retail cuts, you're gonna end up with about 463 retail cuts. And you can see the numbers start to go down. Um, and then you start to think about, okay, well, what about that 1,000 pound steer that Shane said was kind of our typical finish weight for, uh, for forage fed beef? So we had a 1,000 pound uh, steer, and then he's going to end up with about 624 pounds of carcass, and then only about 382 pounds of cuts. Now, the thing about a forage finished beef, those cattle are typically lighter muscled, and they're typically um, not as fat. 
as the as the grain finished beef so that's going to affect our dressing percentage and it's and it's going to have somewhat of an effect on our our retail cut percentage so those numbers may be a little bit more decreased in addition to that um, these numbers are not hard and fast these are just some estimates so you can get an idea of what to expect um, now, I know in Arkansas that that 1,000 pound steer is kind of our goal. That's where you really want to be finishing out cattle. But I know that there's some cattle that are, that are sent to harvest, maybe even lighter weights. And so if you start thinking about sending an 800 pound steer to harvest, um, he's a big yearling calf, looks good and fat. You think, well, we're going to go ahead and just send him rather than sell him. Um, those cattle are not going to dress at 62 percent. They're typically going to dress even lighter than that. So you're going to be talking about 480 pounds of carcass. Um, the lighter the calf is, the less muscle it's going to have as a percentage of its body weight. So you're going to even have a smaller percentage of retail cuts. And so that 800 pounds of steer is only going to equate to about 278 pounds of retail cuts. Um, and they're going to be pretty lean. Um, and not have a lot of marbling typically. Um, and then some folks even I have um, heard are even sending lighter weight calves, you know, like a 600 pound calf to harvest. Um, again, the lighter they are, the lower their dressing percentage is going to be just because the smaller calf is going to have a lighter, a smaller percentage of muscle to bone. Um, so you're going to be looking at about a 360 pound carcass and you're only going to be getting about 200 pounds of retail cuts. Um, now, in a lot of states, and somewhat in Arkansas, you'll see a lot of cattle that go to market that are, um, that are dairy cattle. And so I did the same math kind of with a dairy steer. You know, you have an 800-pound um, dairy calf. Um, again, these dairy cattle, they don't have as good at high a dressing percentage as the beef-type animals. You know, they've got the big rib cage. They're lighter muscled. Um, they're typically not as fat, so they're going to have a, light, a smaller carcass weight. Um, so that 800-pound calf is going to be about 460-pound carcass. The lighter muscle calf is going to have a lower um, retail yield, so you're only going to end up with about 248 pounds of retail cuts. Um, so 248 pounds of retail cuts sounds like a lot, it sounds like, um, but what are you going to get? You know, how many if you go back to that 1200 pound calf, um, if you do the math and you think about, okay, what, what am I going to take home from um, the plant? Um, and so I, I, I did some math based on some Colorado State data where they had, um, they had published the percentage of each of these cuts um, and then looked at about how many retail cuts we would get out of each of these. And so um, you're going to get a lot of ribeye steaks. You're going to get about 30 or 35. Um, depending on how thick you cut them. Um, you're going to get some short steaks or skirt steaks, short ribs. Uh, you'll get two flank steaks. Um, you'll get about 25 to 30 strip steaks. Um, you're, you'll get your tenderloin. You can have that as a roast or you can cut that into steaks. Um, top sirloin, that's one that you can cut lots of different ways. You can get some great big cuts and you can get 16 of them or you can get 30 some odd of those little top, top sirloin steaks. That's one of my favorite steaks. Um, the ball tip roast, and tri-tip roast are also out of the loin, um, great cuts. Um, and then some of our other cuts that you might see would be, um, you're gonna get top round steaks, bottom round steaks, eye of round steaks, you'll get some knuckle roasts and heel roasts. Um, and these are cuts that, the, that are a lot of pounds in the animal. Um, and so, so you're talking about 30 or 40 top round steaks and 20 and 30 bottom round steaks. Um, the flat iron is a really popular cut because it's so tender. Unfortunately, there's only two um, of those muscles in the carcass, one on each side, and so they don't they don't produce a lot. You're going to get, you know, somewhere between eight and twelve steaks of flat iron. Um, then you'll get some petite tenders and some other things, um, and then you'll get two briskets. The thing about these cuts is that there's some folks um, of my generation that have no idea how to cook top round steaks. And they probably are not, it would take them two years to go through 15 top round roasts. Um, so there's a lot of cuts on this slide that I thought had some potential um, that you probably might want to think about. Well, we might want to throw some of that into ground. And so I looked at some of those top round, bottom round, eye of round, knuckle, 
that they're good cuts and, and there's probably lots of folks out there that have great recipes um, for, for, for those cuts. Um, but those are some cuts that you have some potential to grind. You might think about grinding those or asking the processor, yeah, I don't really need 30 bottom round steaks. Maybe we ought to grind those up or grind half of them. So um, in addition to all of these whole muscle cuts, you're gonna get some ground beef. You'll have um, lean trim that comes in 50% lean, 73% lean, 85% lean. Typically in a small plant, they just mix all that together. Um, there's also neck meat and shank meat um, that will be part of your, from your carcass. You can have your butcher cut those into um, neck roast and shank, cross cut shanks if that's something that you want. Um, I, those are things that I would choose to grind. So you're gonna get about 186 pounds of ground beef. Um, and then if you wanted to cut up half of those cuts that I had on the previous slide, that would be an additional about 50 pounds, 52 pounds of ground beef. Um, and ground beef isn't the only thing that you could process um, from them. You know, you might think about beef for kebabs or you might think about having them made into beef for stew or cube steaks or some other, other cuts that might interest you um, that would be more of a processed cut. Um, so that would be the amount of ground beef you would get. And, and again, if you start thinking about making those lighter weight calves, you're gonna start shrinking those numbers as, as they go to harvest. And I'm gonna work on some um, tables that, that would not be, they'd be too busy for this presentation, but I'm gonna share them on my, on my Mom at the Meat Counter Facebook so you can see some of those numbers as you get into those smaller animals and larger animals. Um, so I appreciate the time um, to talk about, about beef with beef producers. Um, there's my email. And again, my blog is mom at the meat counter. You can find me on Facebook. Um, and so uh, Mr. Andy Shaw is the CEO at Cypress Valley. Um, and he is up next and he is going to talk about the ins and outs of a processing facility. So um, as Dr. Yancey mentioned, I am Andy Shaw with Cypress Valley Meat Company, Natural State Processing. And we've uh, recently had a, a partnership with uh, 5R Meats in, uh, in Mount Vernon. And so give you a little bit of background. We have uh, two, in, uh, two inspected facilities. We have one in uh, Pottsville, Arkansas, where we process federally inspected large animals. We have one in Clinton, Arkansas, where we uh, do uh, pasture-raised poultry under uh, federal inspection. Then we have a large animal custom plant in Clinton, Arkansas. And then we also have, again, partnered up with 5R Meats in Mount Vernon, and that's a custom large animal plant as well. And so uh, today we're going to discuss the ins and outs and kind of the do's and don'ts of meat processing. Um, I had a presentation prepared for, for tonight and, and kind of went through it. And as I got some phone calls this week and, and got some uh, questions on some things to cover, I've changed it up a little bit. So I'm going to cover a lot of topics here in, in a short amount of time. But I I think that they're very relevant in to what's going on in today. And one of the biggest questions that we get right now is why don't you guys uh, open a new plant? Why don't you guys have a, a new facility opened up yet? Or why isn't there more processors in the state? And so I'm going to kind of talk through uh, tonight some of those some of those things. But but I'd like to first off give the um, uh, the kind of the barriers or the uh, current state of processing in Arkansas. I think our state is very fortunate to have a lot of great processors, a lot of great custom plants and, and inspected plants. We've got a lot of very experienced uh, uh, processors, owner operators out there that do a fantastic job of, uh, of meat processing. I think that, um, you know, if you look back pre-COVID, we were in a really, uh, there, was several, there was a few processors that had a significant backlog, but for the most part, a lot of processors in Arkansas were in a pretty decent spot. Uh, you know, now since COVID, it's it's different. Most processors right now are in an eight to 12 month backlog. And, you know, the, the biggest challenges right now for processors are, um, as always, labor. But the biggest thing is infrastructure. They, you know, most processors at this point have maxed out infrastructure and are um, from a cooler space to uh, the number of head that they can harvest to the processing uh, facility, all those things um, uh, in general are just maxed to capacity. And so there, there's a lot of processors that are looking right now to expand and uh, we are one of those. Well, hopefully we'll have an expansion uh, complete in quarter one of, of next year and be able to uh, accommodate a lot more uh, of the customer's needs and have uh, the, reduce the backlog that we have significantly. Uh, but the, um, 
uh, the building a new plant, the, the, the barriers to entry that I'd like to kind of go over tonight and why it takes a little bit to, to put it together is, you know, the high startup costs are, are one. Um, uh, some of the land cost is a part of it, but the, uh, a lot of times, you know, people have land that they already have that is uh, been given to them or they have some family land or that they could have access to. Uh, the, the facility cost is one of the largest uh, uh, barriers though. Right now, if you look at USDA, uh, their, their website, or if you go on like the Niche Meat Processors Network, the square footage uh, cost for a new facility is anywhere from 350 to $600 per square foot. And the reason why that cost is so high, when you look at um, the slab, the drains, the equipment, the refrigeration, the wastewater, the permit, all those things when, it, when they add up to, to 300, 600, 350 to $600 per square foot, you know, it, it, makes, uh, it makes startup costs ridiculously high. And as you're looking at the business model and your business plan to cash flow this, uh, it, it, it creates some challenges. The occupancy costs uh, also, you know, your utilities, your water usage, your electrical rates, all those things factor in. And it's in an industry on a, on a small processor that works off low profit margins. And so as you, as you look at this and you run your business model and the feasibility study, uh, it, it becomes challenging to uh, make it cash flow. Uh, there's also the seasonality of the business. Um, right now, that, that's, that's not an issue because everybody is uh, certainly maxed out and will be uh, through the, look, the remainder of this year. But, but in years past, obviously, there is a... Uh, uh, seasonality to it where you see in the winter time that it gets uh, fair seasons over you see a lot of uh, beef about a cattle and and hogs going into processing and it gets it gets slam packed and then when you look into the summer months you'll see a lot of times that uh, there's processors that are taking off uh, a month at a time because it gets slow. And so that does create some challenges from a cash flow standpoint and also a labor retention standpoint. Um, finding skilled employees, we'll talk a little bit about uh, in just a second, but, but that, is, that is a big part of it as well. And then financing, you know, when you're pre uh, presenting that uh, financial model to potential lenders or investors, uh, it sometimes is challenging to, to show a real optimistic model that, uh, that gets to a cash flow positive in, in the first couple of years um, and, you know, with the, with the lower margins. So those are, those are some of the barriers to entry. Those, uh, those are not meant to discourage, but just as things to take into consideration is, is if there's people that are considering doing that, those are things that I would certainly look into and, and make sure that those are very well thought out. Uh, the other question was, you know, daily responsibilities of, a, of an owner operator, what type of hats do you wear? And uh, one is, is industry knowledge, obviously. Um, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna open a steakhouse, you have to know how to cut a steak. Um, that's pretty much a given, but there's a lot of other hats that, a, that an owner operator wears throughout the course of a, of a day or a week. And, you know, business acumen, having a basic uh, business skills and understanding how to run a business is extremely important. Accounting skills, uh, food safety, obviously, in this industry is critical. And if you get into the inspected side, having an understanding of meat science, food science, to be able to deal with the USDA regulatory side of things and uh, your HACCP plan, your hazard analysis and critical control plan that you uh, write and present to the USDA. And that, that, that's what they're holding you accountable to on a daily basis to have that understanding of that. Um, in, this, in this industry, if you're going into this local beef, uh, coming from local farms, animal welfare is big across the, uh, the whole ecosystem, but, but especially for this niche, it's something that the, the customer wants to know where the animal's coming from, and they, they want to know how it's handled and how it's treated, and that's very uh, important. Um, high level understanding of maintenance, you're going to have stuff that's breaking and tearing down. So you want to have a high level understanding of that. And then uh, management and leadership is, uh, is really, really critical. Right now it's uh, on the forefront because you're seeing we're, we're working through a pandemic and a, um, you know, this COVID-19 crisis and bringing people into work in a critical uh, sector is very important to motivate them. And uh, we've been very blessed and very fortunate with some uh, great people that have been dedicated and coming in and, you know, and continue to, hopefully we can continue to operate and without any disruptions. But I know that that's been a real challenge for a lot of processors through this time as well. Uh, the last one here, uh, actually, uh, Dr. Yancey pointed this out to me, and I'm so glad that she did, because adaptability and creative thinking, um, I added that because 
when, when you look at the business model that you ride and if, if somebody's thinking about opening a processing plant, uh, what you think is going to be your business model for three years very likely uh, could change. The, the market could go a different direction. Um, the percentage of, your, of your, your product mix, pork, beef, lamb, goat, whatever it may be, that could change. And so the, the ability to be able to adapt to that, uh, to be a creative problem solver and thinker and be able to uh, pivot when your business model needs to, to change, to overcome a uh, downturn uh, over the economy or a downturn in a specific species or business model that you have. And, and that inevitably will happen and your ability to uh, navigate through that is very critical to, to long-term success. Uh, going back to workforce, this is an industry, uh, if you're looking at a small processor, there's, this is an industry that doesn't have a ton of automation. Um, when you bring in uh, carcasses, let's just say you were processing um, 10 beef a day and all those beefs went, beef went out half or quarter, you look at the different amount of times that you're gonna change cutting instructions and the different customers that you're dealing with and their different needs, there's not a lot of automation that's put to that. So it requires a, a, a workforce that is very knowledgeable uh, and very skilled that has a background in um, not only uh, breaking down a carcass, but also to getting it retail ready and being able to put it in a, a presentable package for the consumer. And so that's something that's very, very important. And uh, that's when you, when you look at opening a facility, uh, how are you gonna, how are you gonna find that for workforce? Uh, if you're not able to find them, how are you gonna train, um, you know, people to, to learn that skill set to get them where they need to be? And then long-term, how are you gonna retain them and keep them uh, in your business? The next thing, uh, Dr. Yancey did an incredible job of, of covering this, but I, I want to kind of go through the farmer and producer expectations, and I, and I think it's important for um, the, uh, the farmer or the, the producer. If you're, if you're selling freezer beef, I think the, the, the more knowledgeable you are on um, the product and what you're selling to your, to your customers, uh, the more successful you're going to be. I think that just setting clear expectations is very, very important. I know that, uh, again, that this has already been covered, but you, the, 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 some of the things that uh, the factors that affect the yield are genetics. Uh, when you look at the weight of the animal, again, the breed, uh, those things have been covered. When you even look at the age of the animal, so as you see uh, older animals, not only are you going to have some muscle loss, but you even look at animals that are over 30 months of age. Um, that because of federal guidelines, when you have a, a, an animal that's over 30 months due to BSE, you have to remove all the specified risk material. So all the backbone comes out. So for example, uh, you couldn't get a T-bone back because that's on the backbone. So you would have to remove that. You would get back uh, a New York strip and a filet. And that's not, that's not a bad thing, but you are going to lose some weight there because that, that bone's going to be removed. So just understanding that and communicating that to the customer on the front end uh, is very, very important to them and having a great customer experience. You know, uh, again, Dr. Yancey pointed all this stuff out earlier, but the, the body score of the animals, if they're if excessively fat, doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing. You know, if you have an animal that comes in excessively fat, they may be a very high quality grade. It could grade out, uh, you know, high select choice or even prime. And that's, that's good from a quality standpoint, but your take home yield could be less because you may be at a point where it's wasty fat and you have to trim some of that off. Um, uh, another big, big thing is cutting instructions. Uh, how you cut that animal up uh, is, is determines uh, what your yield and what your take home percentage is going to be. So, for example, we have some uh, customers that are getting it, the, the carcass fabricated into um, like subprimals where we're doing very little trimming, very little work to it. We're breaking it down into to large subprimals or primals. We're, we're packaging that and sending them out uh, more whole. That yield percentage is extremely high. When you go and you bone the whole animal out and it all goes into a hamburger and you have all that bone loss, it doesn't mean that that's a bad thing. It just means that you're going to see a, a different yield percentage and a different uh, amount of take-home meat. So that's very important as you're selling these different uh, things, uh, these different carcasses at different types of beef and the different cutting instructions to communicate that to the customer. Uh, a couple of slides here just to kind of to, to illustrate that point 
in the live pounds of, of these animals you'll see here you can look at the average carcass weight and then as you look at like an immature female how that that's going to de decrease if you get into dairy breeds uh, you're going to see you know the, another uh, decline there and then excessively fat or poorly muscled uh, going back to dairy breeds we've got in some Holsteins that graded uh, you know, very well they were a high quality they, they marbled up well um, and so I'm not knocking that it's just that they're going to have a larger frame and not, maybe not the muscle mass on it and as robust as, as it would be in a, a different type of breed and so you're going to have a little bit less of a uh, dress percentage these things aren't necessarily bad um, but they're they just need to be communicated to the customer that way they have the clear expectations up front and that's where we see uh, the, the biggest disconnect is sometimes when customers come in and, and don't have that. Um, this next slide just kind of talks about the yield grades and it shows the differences between uh, the weights of carcasses and then if you're getting that primarily back bone in or boneless. And even within this slide, as you look at it, there's a lot of variability here in cutting instructions. So um, there is so many different ways. If you looked at you know, some of the stuff that Dr. Yancey presented on those different cuts, there are so many different ways that you can uh, merchandise that and cut that and break it down that it, it, there's an endless uh, possibility of, of variables and, and likewise uh, endless possibility of what your take home weight can be. And so that's not uh, uh, uncommon to, to be, you know, that bring in beef the same size. And if they were all the same size and have multiple uh, different cutting instructions and you get a lot of different variability in what your take home yields will be. So just that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, as you look at the cutting instructions, you know, with the customer, just ways to explain that. Uh, I'll, I'll give a, a example of like, if you have a bone in rib steak or a rib eye, that's the same cut of meat. One of them does has a rib. I mean, one of them has a bone, one of them does not. So if you look at the overall yield of that, um, your, obviously your bone-in steak is going to have a higher yield than your boneless. doesn't mean that it has a higher value. And so it, it looked at retail level, your, your rib steak is going to be cheaper than your boneless ribeye. And so that when you see something, when, when a customer gets less yield, it doesn't mean that they've gotten less value. It just means that they have got it, they've chose to get it cut up differently. And so that's important to communicate because a lot of customers want a lot of things back boneless or they don't want to get their soup bones back or they don't want to get different, different items back that's certainly uh, there's no problem with that it's just that uh, they just need to understand that and that the value is is in the steak being boneless and it's not necessarily if they got less pounds they don't have to be they shouldn't be disappointed again educating the customers is, is so key um, to uh, to getting a great customer experience and uh, I use this example earlier, I was talking to Dr. Gadbury and we, we were visiting about this and you know, we, we had a, a customer, uh, I'm gonna switch to pork for just a second because this is a great illustration, but we, we had a customer that dropped off a animal, uh, dropped off a hog and it was for another customer and, and they had sold it to them and it was, it was a really nice hog. And the customer come in to give his cutting instructions and he told us how thick he wanted his pork chops. And we said, all right, that's wonderful. How, how would you like your ham and your, uh, your bacon and your shoulder done? And he said, well, actually, I'd like all that back into pork chops too. And so we, we tried to explain to him that, you know, well, you've got some different cuts. He said, no, no, I, you don't understand. I don't eat that stuff. Just put everything into pork chops. And once we explained to him that we couldn't do that, he was very disappointed. He was under the impression that everything could come back into pork chops. Now that was a customer education. We got everything worked out, but I think that it's very important that your customers know on the front end what their expectations expectations are that way when they come in they know what they're going to be getting back they know what if they're getting boneless what it's going to what their yields are going to uh, it's going to sacrifice a little bit and just educating that customer on the front end pays dividends on the back end and keeps a, a long-term satisfied customer uh, Dr. Yancey covered this as well on the custom exempt versus federal inspection. We get a lot of we get a lot of questions on that on what is um, what is actually per permissible on the custom exempt. How far can you go? And so, if you want to look it up, you can look at the uh, federal regulations. Uh, you could Google the 9 CFR 303.1 code. You can you can look that up, and it goes into great detail on the uh, what you can and can't do under custom exemption. Basically as it was laid out earlier, if you're bringing in an animal that you own or if you've sold a live animal to somebody and you dropped it off at processing for them, as long as they have possession of that animal, they're taking possession of the live animal and they can process it and it can go out with a not for sale stamp on it. That can go under custom, ex custom exempt. Uh, 
If you're wanting to sell into farmers markets or river markets, or you're wanting to go into uh, restaurants or wholesale distribution channels, then it'll need to bear the mark of federal inspection and have that USDA uh, bug in it. So I think that that's something that we get a lot of questions on uh, of what you can and can't do. And, and there's, there's some gray areas on custom exemption, but if you want to look that code up, you can go through all that and it, and it cites all the different regulations there on what's permissible and what is not under USDA guidelines. Um, so opportunities and concerns, I think that if we look at the, the farm to table movement, it was on the rise. It was growing very well. Um, I think that uh, this COVID-19 has accelerated that. I think we've seen a increased awareness. I think that we've, uh, we've expanded the customer base. There's new customers that's never tried uh, this, this local beef and, and, and tried buying from local farmers that has uh, recently done that through this experience due to a variety of reasons, due to retail pricing or potentially some outages or uh, they just wanna know where their, their food's coming from. They wanna buy local. There's been a variety of reasons, but it's turned on a new customer that uh, it's, it's really exciting about the future. Uh, it's disrupted shopping patterns. You know, where there's, when you go in, and, and have a disruption for a day or two. It's not a big deal, even a week, but this is this COVID-19 has disrupted shopping patterns for over, uh, you know, multiple months now. And so people are looking at buying, um, you know, proteins in a different way. And it's created an opportunity for local farmers and local processors to, to be able to uh, um, share uh, the benefits of, of buying local and, and, and to, uh, to sharing also the, the, some of the issues with the centralized food system and how that having more localized processors can help with that. And I think that's uh, some industry experts think that since the pandemic that it's accelerated this local food movement by 10 years. And I would, I would tend to agree with that. Um, talking with, talking with um, farmers and about some of the concerns, um, you know, potentially um, at some point, if, if we go back to um, uh, the prices come down, there could potentially be some market saturation uh, where I, I think we're a long ways from that right now because there's certainly uh, unmet demand that, you know, we all want to capitalize on. Um, but I think that could in the future uh, be uh, be a one potential issue. And then also uh, brand integrity. You know, a lot of farmers are uh, have some concerns about some of the things that, that potentially are happening where you see somebody taking uh, 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 old uh, cull cow and selling that is a uh, you know a nice pasture raised beef and and you know somebody's having a, a poor experience with that and, and sometimes uh, that it, it kind of jeopard it has the potential to jeopardize the brand of people that are doing an incredible job of raising the beef and, and putting it out whether it be on a, a forage based or or a, a grain a finished uh, diet regardless they are that right now that there is some farmers that are doing an incredible job of that and that's some potential uh, concerns that that could arise but I think right now the uh, it, it does appear that the sky is the limit and it's a uh, it's an exciting time for this niche industry both for the farmer side and the processor side. Okay thanks Andy I appreciate that that introduction and I think um, everybody at this to this point has done a really good job of kind of explaining what we're going to be looking at uh, as we get into the industry. Um, one of the things that uh, is my career, I work uh, for the University of Arkansas in the Animal Science Department uh, as a program associate for forage, and I spent a, a lot of my time working with various producers around the state, educating them on uh, grazing management and control grazing, that kind of thing, forage management to help them extend their grazing season. But uh, in addition to my career, um, I'm also the third generation farmer here at Simon Farm. And, and that's what I've been asked to talk about here tonight is, is um, for coming from a, from a producer perspective that's selling calves, direct marketed off the farm, just kind of what that process looks like and how we're going about doing that. And just to give you a little bit of a background about our operation, this is um, uh, my late grandfather, uh, Robert Simon, founded a farm back in, back in 1936, and we've been able to maintain it in the family farm ever since. Uh, we're located just east of Conwin, a, a little small community called Sotelo. We're a, uh, just a small cow-calf operation. We're going to have about 35 cows uh, that's grazing on about 130 acres of pasture. Now, uh, like I said earlier, with my job uh, in extension is working as one of the forage, forage specialists and advising people, I've always been a strong advocate in believing about practicing what we preach and so when I look at it kind of our management style and what how we operate out here um, 
I, I'm a lot, but do a lot better job, or at least I feel I do a lot better job at managing the forage base and managing the grazing uh, season and controlling those animals than probably what I do on the cattle side. Um, so, so forage management is going to be key to our, our, our operation. Um, we're going to be in central Arkansas here. We're going to be primarily warm season grasses. We're going to have grasses like Bermuda grass, crab grass, uh, a little bit of Dallas grass and, and Bahia grass. And then we're going to oversee those, uh, oversee the Bermuda grass pastures with some, some rye grass. Maybe we're going to include some, uh, maybe some pearl millet or, or some, um, um, some spring oats, whatever we can do that we can help, that we think is going to help kind of fill in some of the, the seasonal forage production grabs that may, we may have throughout the year. Uh, another thing that we're going to use very extensively is controlled grazing. We're going to manage where those where the cattle are grazing at any given point throughout the year. So we, this helps us in our management decisions, put the animals uh, on the grass at a certain period of time, leaving them there for the defined number of days, and then pulling the cattle back off of that and giving them a rest period. And we do that uh, through the use of electric fence and, and water distribution. Water distribution is going to be key as you go into a grazing management situation. Trying to, it's not necessarily the, the abundance of water that you have on your property, but so in such that that water is distributed around the property so that you're getting good uh, animal grazing management, good uniform grazing across the pasture. And we do that uh, through our water facilities using, using tire tanks, and that's something that's worked very well for us. Uh, to talk a little bit about the cattle, um, we, we do have a defined breeding and calving season. We've got the herds, uh, they're split into two groups. We have a spring herd and a fall herd. Uh, we're going to be primarily spring herd that matches up better with our forage production, but to help with a year-round distribution of, of having the calves that we can market off the farm, we've got a fall group as well. Uh, record keeping is something that's critical, so and in doing and helping us to, to maintain those records, uh, we're going to identify each animal. Each animal is going to be given their own unique identification number, and that's going to help us track not, not only production information about the animal, but it also helps us track um, the, the information on if the animal was to get sick or and, and we're treating it. But we like to keep a lot of production records. We want to know that the cattle are being productive. We want to know we want to know when they're calving, what the calf weighs at weaning time, and then how that calf is doing post weaning. Uh, through the yearling yearling phase and then also as it carries out over into the to the final product of processing. Herd health, uh, I would believe very strongly in keeping the animals healthy, keep keeping them healthy, keeping them vaccinated uh, against the various diseases and things like that to keep them healthy. I don't want to get I don't want for an animal to ever get sick because of some negligence on our part. We will use antibiotics if it's necessary, uh, but we try to minimize those by using the appropriate vaccines. Um, as Dr. Gadbury mentioned in his presentation earlier, he said he kind of split his presentation into a, a forage-based diet versus a grain grain finished diet. What we're going to use is a, is a hybrid combination system of this, and this is something that, that Dr. Gadbury and I have talked talked a lot, a lot a lot about and he's gave me a lot of uh, professional advice and helped us to get started helped us to on finishing this ration and we market our cattle as pasture raised beef uh, and and so kind of what this means to us is these are cattle that that are their own defined group of cattle we have those cattle separated from the cow herd separated from the uh, the yearling growing growing calves and this is a cow, set of cattle that's managed on their own particular own individual needs, they're managed on their own set of pastures, and we're going to grain supplement these. Um, and the grain supplements that that what's working really good for us is we're going to feed these cattle for about 90 to 120 days, and we're going to feed them grain at at about half of their total consumption of the diet. So if you if you look at a growing animal, is going to be finishing it. Uh, three percent of their their diet uh, on a dry matter intake basis. We're figuring that half of their diet is coming from a forage base, and the other half coming from grain. Um, you can see there that the kind of the ration that we use. It's 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 a ration. It's a corn brace ration. It's sixty percent chopped corn, and forty percent corn gluten pellets. And in in addition to that, we're also going to feed feed a mineral uh, with an ionophore that's going to help with our feed efficiency and the feed conversion. 
in terms of what we're wanting our animals to look like. And this is something that, that's been a real learning curve for us. We've been doing this uh, selling selling uh, freezer beef, uh, selling uh, selling these calves straight off the farm now for probably going on seven years. And this is something that has been a real learning curve on at what level of finish do these calves need for us to get the optimum carcass weights, the optimum retail cuts and things like that back. And and what we was doing uh, to begin with was, was we've got a set of scales that we weigh the cattle every time they go through the chute, we weigh them. We was basing our finished product on the weight of that animal and was not taking into account the frame size. So what early on we was looking at when the animals got 11 to 1200 pounds, we would market them. Well, what I got to noticing is, is their different body condition score based on the frame size of that animal. Um, we started out early on with, with a more of a Brangus type cattle. Uh, and then since then we have transitioned over, over to Herefords and, and in doing so, uh, the Hereford calves, the, the bulls that we selected have got their, their carcass bulls, their moderate frame bulls are getting more conditioned. But I think more importantly uh, than their, the weight of the animal is the overall body condition scoring. And so as we're looking at these animals, uh, as y'all can see the animal on the right, uh, that's going to be one that's going to be about a body condition score of seven. She's pretty, if you look across her top line, she's pretty square squared off over her backbone. If you look from her shoulders to her hips, uh, you're going to see a lot of a lot of fat cover. You're looking over their 12th and 13th ribs. They're pretty fleshy. But the, kind of the one of the key factors I look for is when the animal starts developing uh, some some fat, fat pockets up around their tail head. To me, that's at a point that they're ready to go. So we look at body condition score and weights. The other thing I want to do that we set kind of as a, as a management goal for ourselves is is I want to be able to have these calves to a finished weight by 24 months at the oldest, and in doing so, um, you know it's, it takes a it takes a good level, a good high level of management, making sure that you've got the the cattle up to the appropriate uh, forage and, and nutritional needs that they have to have. Now to shift gears a little bit from um, from what we do on here on our farm into you know, what some of the challenges and opportunities that not only is, do we face as, as we continue marketing our beef, but for those that may, be, that may be looking at getting into this and getting into it from the first time. And so as we kind of take a look at these, the different steps and things, one of the biggest challenges for us in our first year of from we transition from selling our calves at, at a traditional market, whether we were selling our calves at weaning weight or we were selling them uh, as yearling calves, when we was doing that, selling them as yearlings, we was marketing those calves as a group, selling them at one time a year, and then we was uh, we was balancing our budget based on the income from those calves. Well, when we transitioned from selling that yearling to selling that group of yearling calves, to we went to the point that we're going to be direct marketing. We don't have that that income, that, that, that income from those sell of calves. Um, and so that really struggled. We, we, we had to rely on our, on off the farm income to, to make the payments. Um, Cause you're looking at selling those calves as a yearling weight to seven to 800 pounds versus in selling as a group to where now we're gonna be holding onto those calves another maybe six months to a year trying to put some additional weight on them. That weight's coming from feed. Well, the feed's got a cost that's associated with it. So we got costs there, and then not only that, but when we get that animal to a finished weight, we're gonna have to pay the processor before we get any before we get any money back in return. So starting off with a few animals, starting off with a with a small percentage of your calf calf crop, building that uh, the financial base, building your marketing base would be something that that I think is very critical on the front end and in, in, in kind of balancing a budget. As you go, how are you going to transition from one program to the next? It takes a lot of time, uh, and this is something that uh, that many people don't realize as they're going into it, is, is the amount of time that it takes to get this animal up to a finished weight. And to kind of expand on that, um, here's just kind of a snapshot view of, of some of the different groups of animals that we're going to have and then as we take those animals to the processor and to our consumer what this process looks like um, 
And so kind of as, as we look at this and we break it down a little bit, again, the cows, the cows, we're going to have a defined breeding and calving season. Two thirds of the calves, cows are going to calve in the spring of the year, the remaining third in the fall. Those cows are going to be set, managed separately. They're going to have nursing calves on them up until those calves are about seven months of age. And then at that point, uh, we're going to wean the calves with a low stress uh, management uh, called fence line weaning, where we're going to physically separate the calves uh, using an electric fence where the cows are on one side of the fence, the calves are on the other. As they transition through that through that calf, we're now going to, at that weaning time, we're now going to be managing those calves as a separate group. Those calves are going to be, will have different nutrient requirements than the cows, and so therefore we're man, managing them separately. That is called the stalker calves. The stalker calves, uh, while they're in this group, we're going to try to minimize uh, any additional grain that they get. We're wanting to meet their, their nutritional requirements with the growing forages and that's where these the complementary annuals come in really having a a good idea of the amount of grass that you have out there what type of grass it is the, the availability of it and then managing that so that you that you keep that grass at a vegetative state keeping it at high quality now when those calves are reach about 800 pounds they're going to be transitioned over into this to the what we call the fat calves the slaughter calf group uh, and they're going to remain in this pen for at least 90 days, maybe even 120 days, just depending on the season of the year. Now, and then from that group, they go from the, the fat calves to the processor, then on to the consumer. Now, one of the challenges and stuff that, that I think that as we run into, and I think as many other people would, was if you're going to be selling calves year round, how do you, how do you, how do you time the calves so that they're coming off it? at different times and the way that we do that uh, and just the way that it works best with me is I kind of start at, at the end product when do I want that product to be finished by so if we look at the calf if we look at right now like we've got calves that will be going into the processor in a couple of weeks so if we've got calves uh, that have a processing date of June then those calves are going to have to be started on feed by by at least March to be able to reach our target weight and, and so what we're doing is as each month, as calves go out of the slaughter calf group to the processor, we go over to the stalker calves. Three calves go out of slaughter to the processing. Then we take three calves from this stalker cattle group and we move it over to the slaughter calf. So, it, so at any one get, given period of time, We've got, we've got in the slaughter calf group, we've got calves that are different wages, different, uh, different stages of the, the amount of finish that's on them, different weights. We're transitioning, we're trying to stagger our production to make sure that we've got a good uniform calf crop uh, 12 months of the year. Now, in, in terms of the products we sell, uh, we have multiple different products that we sell. They're all going to be fed out uh, pretty similarly. It's the age of the animal takes takes into effect and whether, um, you know, if it's this animal, uh, the kind of the stage of production that it's at in its life. Our primarily product is, is we're very fortunate and developed a, the exclusive provider for beef uh, for the Root Cafe in Little Rock. Um, the cafe is very unique in the fact that they're going to be sourcing 70 to 75 percent of their menu items are coming from locally grown sources. We've been for them, I won't say the very beginning, but we've been in we've been in business with them kind of from the start. So as they've been growing their business, we've been growing ours, and we've grown together, and we've got a really good working relationship. One of the things that's really unique about the Root Cafe is all the beef that they're buying from us. They're they're going to they've got their custom cut sheet worked out, but they're going to take the whole animal and then they're going to be able to grind it and they're going to produce be producing a, a premium hamburger a hamburger that that's kind of their staple item uh, that's unique to the root cafe and um, the other thing that we're going to do we sell a lot of beef to individuals especially this year uh, we've sold more to individuals this year than than what we have in in the past that's a very good portion of our business those calves. Uh, you know, all, all these calves, the, their body condition score is going to be very similar. Their finished weight of the animals are going to be very similar. What may be different is when we start talking about our, our meat, uh, our ground beef that we would be having available. And this was going, this was the ground beef, if we're going to, if we, which would be seasonal, 
Uh, this would be coming from an animal that this, it's an older animal that just doesn't fit our program for one reason or another. We put that animal on, on feed, get it up to the appropriate uh, level of finish that we think, uh, and then grind it all up for hamburger. One of the, I think the biggest challenges uh, that you may find as you, as you start, is, is you start talking about the process of, of how, how am I going to transition one of the factors that's going to, that, that I'm going to be faced with throughout this transitioning process is due to the limited number of processing facilities that we have in Arkansas, uh, and these facilities being in such high demand, there's a backlog. Uh, and there's a backlog. I know, I know some facilities are, are booked out into March and April of 2021. Other facilities are booked up, are now taking orders of 2022. So what I would always like to tell people is before you start feeding an animal, call the processor, get get to know get to know your processors. Um, you know, Andy Shaw and I have a very good working relationship. We've known each other for years. We have a very good open communication back and forth. I've been, uh, Andy's always been very open. They've taken me all throughout the plant. Um, you know, because we're going to be, we're going to be spending a lot of time, a lot of money in raising these animals into, and for the production aspect. And then we're going to be turning this animal over to our processors and we're going to be at the mercy of the processors on, on the product that we're getting back. And so Andy and I, very good working relationship, but get to know your processors, get, you know, get to know that their, their skill level, their, how they're going to be um, handle, handling the animals as far as their fabrication, what's their capabilities of cutting, um, their freezer space, their, their unloading facilities, their holding pens, things like that. It's very it's very important that you have a really good working relationship with them. Um, uh, again, that, that is going to be key to some of your success is is that working relationship with the processor and getting getting on their scheduling, knowing kind of what their time restrictions are, knowing how far in advance that they're booked, and then using using that scheduling date to kind of help determine what at what point an animal needs to go on feed. Now, to kind of give you an example of of what our cattle is going to look like, and this is this one example of a calf, of a calf that we had. This is a calf that uh, that weighed 1,300 pounds live weight, uh, was dressed out at 60 percent uh, the carcass weight, so we're looking at 780 pounds there. Now, kind of as a testament to the to the product that we have and to the skill set that they have at Cypress Valley, and I was very proud to see this. Our retail weight is 70% of the carcass weight. Um, you know, and as uh, Dr. J Dr. Yancey pointed out earlier, I think that she mentioned the industry, industry average was around 62%. So, I mean, I think our retail weight on that carcass weight is, is very good. Now you'll look at, there'll be a difference in weight between the retail weight uh, that we would be selling to individuals versus what the root cafe would be getting. That difference is, is gonna be because at the root cafe, everything is gonna be deboned. Um, it's going to be deboned before they get it, so that carcass, that that retail weight is it's going to be a little bit less than what it would be for individuals. You can see how we price it, um, and, and we sell our products various methods, and we've sold uh, uh, combinations of these. And this is just how we price it. Um, everybody's going to price it a little bit differently. This is the prices that we've set that's that's been working pretty good from us. Now, something that I want to call your attention to is, is you look at the total price for these animals and you can say, wow, there's, there's the potential for some real added value uh, on our products. We may want to look at getting into this. But take a look at the slide, and, and I'm, not, I'm not a livestock economist, but this is just something that, that, that I want, that I looked at some of the prices, this, uh, um, the livestock market report that come, I think this one may have been for two weeks ago, and we looked at uh, if, if a person's going to be taking a 500 pound calf at weaning time, the calf's going to be uh, seven months of age. You're going to look at if you take it to the traditional market and you look and you take out their, your processing fees, your your commission, your yardage, your handling, and stuff like that, you're going to be bringing home about maybe $700. Well, if you if you choose to keep that calf and sell it as opposed to selling it as a wean calf, you want to keep the calf, put some added put some weight on it, maybe get some added value to the calf. Selling that calf at 14 months of age, you bring on about $840. Okay, so 
and now we're going to transition to instead of selling that calf at our traditional market we're going to be marketing ourselves direct from the freezer we're going to hold on to that animal an additional year so now selling that animal at 24 months and and we're going to have a big cost of the processing fees uh, so what looked like a really good return on your investment at $2,800 uh, that you're selling that animal for you're looking at $1,700. Well, what did it cost you to produce that animal? What's it costing you to, to maintain that cow throughout the year? And, and so even though that you may be getting more per animal and holding these calves, we've had to adjust our stocking rates on, on the cow side. Uh, as the more cows, as the more calves that we sell, uh, we're having to reduce the number of, of mature cows that we can run on the place just due to the, 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 to the um, increase in stocking density of these calves so know what your production cost is study that um, because that can have a have a really big influence on, on whether this is going to be a possible uh, situation for you to get into as i kind of approach the end of our the presentation here look at different marketing um, our primarily market that we do for this is is through our facebook page at simon b um, this is something that we try to keep keep posted on a regular basis. Anytime that we're going to be having beef for sale, anytime that we bring beef to the processor, we try to take a few snapshots of what's going to be coming up, and then and then we put that information as when it's going to be for sale. We, all, you know, and, and the other thing that that we're very big on is is involved in the community. Um, we're very involved with the community. We like to do. We we host various. Uh, educational field days and stuff throughout uh, for the general public to come to. We host um, various farm visits for some of the local daycare, some of the local churches, FA groups, 4-H groups, anything like that. Anything that can, we can get gives us an opportunity to to kind of share our story and what we're doing, what we're doing in the beef industry and how that, how that we're raising our product. 